Well, as we announced last week, we're going to be taking some time this week to give a bit of a review of the year 2018. It's been certainly an eventful year, and so our staff at Korea 24 have selected 10 news stories, and we've also chosen person of the year, kind of similar to uh, what you see with Time Magazine and other publications and media outlets. So we're going to be covering the uh, top 10 issues next Monday. But today, we are going to be uh, announcing the person of the year. Now, you might think it could be a politician or uh, some kind of activist, uh, a prominent figure. Uh, This year, though, uh, we have decided uh, this being a global broadcast and this issue being pertinent not just here in Korea, but all over the world, uh, namely the plight of refugees, that this year's person of the year for KBS World Korea 24 is the Yemeni refugees in Jeju. So for today's uh, special interview, we're very pleased to have joining us an award-winning human rights filmmaker who is working on a series of films about the refugee issue here in Jeju. Uh, Very pleased to have Neil George here in the studio. Sir, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Well, uh, as I uh, briefly alluded to, you're making a film uh, depicting the plight of the Yemeni refugees on Jeju Island. Um, You've done other work here, and we'll talk about that briefly later. But Mm -hmm. this particular topic, uh, what what was sort of the decision-making process to focus on that? Sure. I mean, I work quite closely with a Korean producer friend of mine, Kim Hengil, and he was very interested in what happened when the Yemeni refugees started to kind of slowly come in. And after researching into the, the topic... He just just kind of asked me if I wanted to make a film about this to try and find out a little bit more. The news media at the time, maybe you'll remember, was kind of not exactly giving a lot of information regarding the refugees. So we really wanted to listen to their stories and try and understand their kind of side of everything that was coming out of the media. So that was basically why we initially started to make the film. And we understand that uh, it is, um, the, the production is a partnership with the UNHCR. Yes. Uh, how, can you tell us a little bit how uh, the production is going? Sure, yeah. Basically, we spent about three or four days initially on Jeju just to talk with some of the refugees, just to listen to their stories and figure out the best way to approach the subject. And after doing that, we kind of went back and did some more research and I approached the UNHCR to see if they might be interested in collaborating on the project. They took their time in responding, but eventually they came back and said they'd love to help out. Mm -hmm. And they effectively just gave us a little bit of sponsorship money to help with going to Jeju, as obviously it's quite a lot of time and money spent on production. And so we slowly kind of went back and forth a few times to Jeju now, just to... We want to listen to the stories. I think that's the most important thing. And that's something that we weren't seeing in the media, is we weren't really hearing the voices of these these refugees. The uh, the film itself with the UNHCR, is, is it a short? Yeah, it's, it's a, a series of short films. So there will be around four to five short films that are produced. They're going to be on... I kind of picked the idea of words Mm. and depicting words that we all know things like hope passion family these are words that everybody knows but for them they have a very different meaning so i wanted to try and tell their stories through these words and through their voices and aside from that i understand you're also working on another separate project uh portraying with the the, uh refugees a more feature length uh, right yeah so next year we're going to start the production of the feature documentary so that'll look into the bigger picture obviously the short films are very much more human story orientated Mm -hmm. and the documentary is going to look at the bigger picture including looking at um, korean history with the refugee situation not just yemen as well we're going to touch on places like syria sudan somalia and um, obviously looking at the Middle East and the connection between right. Korea and the so it'll Middle be a East. broader look really at the yeah situation. more of a broader and more informative as mm-hmm. well you know I think a lot of people don't really understand the relationship between Yemen and Korea so I think that's an important thing that Korean people 
can get from this film. Right. And, and you've mentioned that uh, a couple times already uh, during this interview. Mm. Uh, this um, sort of, we can say, misunderstanding among the public or uh, perhaps the way the media has portrayed it. Uh, we were covering this issue as well and mm. it did feel like uh, here the Korean media kind of pitted it more on sort of this framework of this is supposedly something that a lot of people are scared of. Mm. They're fearful. Yeah. Um, of course, all the erroneous reports of sure. this uh, idea <laughs> of um, spreading Islamophobia and yeah. Sharia law yeah. around Korea. And, and and you knew very well that there were those misperceptions uh, mm-hmm. heading into this, uh, even though you said your uh, Korean uh, producer friend had asked you to to take part in sure, this yeah. project. Were there difficulties? Because I imagine there, there has been a lot of um, resistance. And this has been kind of, it, it's almost bizarre that it, there's almost a bipartisan from mm. the extreme right and the yeah. stream left where there's this immense fear and um, you can say resentment or even mm-hmm. outright hostility towards the refugees. Yeah, very much. I mean, I've, we filmed on the streets looking at the, the pro and the anti refugee activists and it was kind of disappointing to be honest. You know, I spent a lot of time filming for the candlelight protests back in 2016 and seeing the solidarity that happened around that. And it almost seems like a kind of reversal in state. People not looking at the information, not looking at the facts, not looking at the history, just deciding really on no opinion, just an opinion that they decided we don't like Muslims, we don't like Islam. We're just going to only focus on that kind of element of it rather than trying to understand, you know, what is actually happening with Yemen and the civil war that's been going on for a long time, not even the recent civil war, but the history of Yemen. And so it was kind of, for me, it was extremely disappointing to see the Korean people considering their history going back, you know, the war, the split, the divide, North, South Korea. And Yemen is basically going through a very similar kind of thing. So I I kind of expected a lot more empathy Mm -hmm. and I just didn't see it. So, you know, that's one of the reasons why we kind of were like, oh, we need to, you know, look into this a lot more. We want people to really see yeah. Actually, there is a huge, like, a huge um, similarity going on between Yemen and Korea. And it's important that people try and look at that as much as right. the fact that it's a humanitarian crisis and people are going through the suffering of war. And it is, um, I suppose, easy to describe the issue as a humanitarian crisis mm. and how uh, most of these refugees, uh, for the most part, they did not choose to to come to Jeju to yep. to settle here or to ask for asylum. Very much. And, and, and your, your, your um, expression of somewhat um, dismay or surprise or disappointment mm. that there wasn't more empathy involved um, in terms of the just the average Joe yeah. on the street. Is that something that you feel is a uniquely Korean phenomenon? Or because we've seen pockets as where you're mm. from in Europe as well, where there does seem to be this growing um, fear, concern, mm. worry, tinged with maybe economic anxiety, as well yeah. as fear of the other that uh, seems to be permeating all around the world. Yeah, I think it's a mixture of many things. It's not just, obviously, like you said, it's not just in Korea. We have in France, in America particularly in America, in Europe yeah. as well. So I think uh, the problem is that probably one of the main issues is people don't really understand where it's come from. Like they just put, put, put it as it's Muslim, it's Islam. But they don't see like the history of the Middle East. Right. And they don't see the influence that America, France, even my own country, United Kingdom has had in the Middle East. Right. And they, you could say that they have a big influence of the outcomes of where we're at at the moment. So... It's a it's a lot more than just a simple, simple case of they're, they're Islamic. I don't think it's it's not that simple question. It's and, a it's a big, yeah, it's a big conversation to be had. And really, just stuck in the middle of all of this are these um, refugees who are essentially in limbo. Exactly. Uh, the Korean yeah. government did recently make uh, a decision, and mm-hmm. they were facing a lot of pressure. Uh, yeah. These mass protests on the street, and they were mindful of that. Certainly, when they had that very restrictive policy, you spoke with these refugees. Um, how do they feel? Because I, you know, you can you you can have a German example of how mm. they uh, um, uh, deal with refugees, and then you can have the other extreme, where yeah. it it could be just a country like the U.S. or some other European countries, or even Korea. And mm. uh, do you get a sense of them also feeling disappointment or dismay, or yeah, I think they initially when some of the first results came out the families were given the initial like humanitarian visas they were a, bit, a little surprised 
uh, just that. So they were, but they were very optimistic that they're going to get refugee status. And when you listen to the, some of their stories, you know, some of them are like police officers. There's journalists in there. You know, I don't see how you can distinguish one particular job, yeah. so to say, as being persecuted against. You know, all of them go back if they were to go back somehow to Yemen. Obviously, not possible, but if they were to go back. There's an incredibly high possibility they're going to be persecuted. Right. So, for me, it was difficult to kind of fathom why the Korean government only gave them the humanitarian status, when clearly quite a lot of them should be qualified right. as refugees. When when can we see sort of uh, the first fruits of your labor as far as the uh, listening public? Goes? Yeah, sure. I mean, hopefully, we're going to be releasing at the beginning of next year. So around January, end of January time, I'm trying to. I would like to release them as a series mm. because they'll. So we can they, binge it. Yeah, then you can. <laughs> it's a bit more impactful right. to be as a series, um, but that will depend on like production times. Okay. So hopefully, beginning of next year. Yeah. And and just just to round things out because I briefly mentioned this in the beginning, but uh, you are actually a long established uh, uh, documentary filmmaker. Uh, you're based here in Korea. You've done other uh, works that have really caught public attention, including um, the uh, the Seoul Ferry tragedy. Mm. You mentioned the uh, the candlelight protest, yeah. which uh, resulted in in a change of government. And um, you do. Um, I, I, it it seems uh, tend to focus on a lot of issues dealing with human rights, um, mm -hmm. particularly as it pertains here in Korea. Uh, is that something that uh, is going to be part of your focus and passion going forward here in Korea? Is that where you foresee kind of your your um, your your energies uh, to be sure. directed at? Yeah, I mean, when I first came here, I I knew a fair amount about the country, and it was kind of an interesting time in 2011, 2012. Like Pakane was just coming into power around that sort of time, and the country was definitely changing. And after initially meeting some of the North Korean refugees when I was working on a film with them, that made me even more interested in social issues. Mm. I'd already started in England. I'd done a lot of social issue content, so it was just a natural progression. And then obviously the Sable film as well was a fascinating yeah. thing to see, and the transformation of the country that happened. Around sort of end of 2016, with you know Park Geun-hye being impeached, and so like this country for me is is really interesting. There's a lot of things still going on. There's still a lot of you know issues mm. that are happening with the elderly, with the young, with suicide, with you know it's kind of never ending in terms of topics. So I wouldn't, I wasn't actually expecting to be making a film about Yemen refugees right. in South right. Korea. So for the fact that I was able to, I was feel very privileged to. To be able to speak with them and talk with them and understand their stories, and hopefully in the future there'll be more. Yeah. Well, the hope for me, and I think many of our listeners would uh, maybe agree, is that uh, you find it more and more difficult to find source material here <laughs> to be able to make these documentaries. But yeah. something tells me that uh, there will be uh, other issues uh, for you to certainly uh, delve into and sink your teeth into. Um, no it's going to be a fascinating project. I hope a lot of people uh, get to check it out. Neil George, thank you so much for joining us, and really uh, appreciate your time and happy holidays to you. Yeah, you too. Thank you very much. Thank you. 